Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to come in from the waiting room. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. All right. Do we need to change the settings so we have a spotlight on the speaker? Um, would you like to do that, Rebecca? Um, I would if I remembered how. Don't know how to do that. All right. Welcome, everybody, to My Jewish Learnings class on virginity in the Talmud. I'm Rachel Scheinerman. I edit My Jewish Learning. And for this special class, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Rebecca Cam Holtz. Um, Dr. Cam Holtz is a scholar of ancient Judaism and gender and sexuality, and she wrote a remarkable dissertation on this subject, which you can read in full afterward if you're so inclined. But um, we're really delighted she's here, especially for those who are joining us in the midst of the Daf Yomi cycle, who are studying Tractate Yevamot. This is this subject has come up a lot recently. It's been kind of confusing re recently. So it'd be really interesting to take a few minutes or an hour, as it were, today and think through um, what is virginity. Um, because one of the things we're going to discuss right off the top is that we don't actually, there is not a set definition for that term. You might think you know what it means, but you might, it, the word might not mean what you think it means. Um, so uh, please, in the chat, tell us where you are from and what your name is and introduce yourself a bit. And we will I will hand over the mic, the virtual microphone to Dr. Cam Holtz to get started. Um, yeah, I am very happy to be here. So welcome to everyone. Um, and so first, I just wanted to let you know that there should be visible in the chat um, a link to um, a Google Doc that I created that has the sources on it that I'm going to be talking about. So that will be helpful for you guys uh, to be able to go view it and refer back to it as we talk about it. Uh, I'll show, I'll share my screen, um, but I'm, you're probably going to want to go back and take a look at things again as we continue talking. Um, and yeah, also, so I, you know, I am going to be explaining and lecturing about things, but I would also very much like to be interactive. So if you have a question, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat, um, virtually do the raise your hand button. Um, I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on that. If I start to miss people, Rachel uh, is my backup and she will uh, remind me um, if I start to miss questions, but yeah, I am very happy to take questions. Um, there, this is complicated and confusing. So I hope that you guys will have plenty of questions and not be afraid to ask them. Um, yeah, and then final uh, content note before we get started is I did just wanna mention, you guys are, if you've been following along with Dafyomi, you're familiar with this, um, but some of the sources that we're reading today are talking about sex with children. Um, and they're not endorsing it, <laughs> you know, they're not graphic about it, but I just like to flag that because that can be difficult for some people. Um, but yeah, so with that said, uh, let's start talking about virginity in the Talmud. Um, and this is a very complicated topic. I mean, I am biased. I did write my entire dissertation on it. Um, but, you know, this virginity is something that has been important in cultures throughout time. You know, we have evidence from many, many cultures that they were concerned about virginity. They wanted a reliable way to track it. They wanted a reliable way to verify it, that it was important socially, religiously, all of those reasons. So, and we're gonna continue to expand on some of those reasons about why it's important. Um, but so first I want to kind of set the stage a little bit for some of the stakes around virginity in the Talmud. Uh, and then we're going to get into a little bit more of a general question of what does it even mean? What are we talking about when we talk about virginity? Um, and again, just a note, we are talking almost exclusively here about female virginity. Um, you know, there it's not that there's not a concept of male virginity, but it is a lot less complicated. It's a lot less fraught. Um, so here we're gonna be focusing pretty much completely on female virginity. If you have questions about male virginity, I am happy to do my best to answer them. It's not 
quite as much of a specialty for me, but, and again, there's just so much less material on it. Um, but okay. So I just want to point out, um, kind of the two main areas in rabbinic culture where virginity has real kind of measurable stakes. Um, and the first is that it's important economically and it's important basically in sort of the marriage market. Um, and, you know, the rabbinic laws around marriage work a little bit differently than the way that a lot of us are familiar with. But basically, whether a bride is virgin or not determines what's called her ketubah payment. And the ketubah is the marriage contract, <clears throat> but one of its required stipulations is this thing that's called a ketubah payment. And it's so sort of integrated into what it is and how it works that it's often just referred to as a ketubah, even though it's only one small part of that marriage contract. Um, but the ketubah payment is essentially an amount of money that the groom agrees to pay the bride at the end of the marriage. So this is unlike a dowry, which is paid at the beginning. In rabbinic culture, this is actually paid at the end. So this would be if the man dies and leaves her a widow, or if they get divorced, then this would be the amount of money they, they've agreed that he will have to pay to her. And it functions kind of as a social support. You know, women don't have a lot of options for supporting themselves other than family and marriage. So this kind of serves as a way for her to support herself in between marriages. And so virgins can command a higher ketubah payment than non-virgins. So, and this is gonna bring up questions about contract and veracity and all kinds of things that we'll get to in more detail. Um, but then the second point that I wanted to make is, you know, it's socially important and it's religiously important. Um, you know, it is, as we're maybe a little bit more familiar with, it's an aspect of someone's social reputation. You know, if they are suspected of somehow being sexually promiscuous, you know, that can damage a woman's reputation. It can damage her marriage prospects. It can, you know, it can reflect on her family. Uh, and it's also, you know, I mean, it is perhaps not to the extent that it often is in Christianity, but it is a religious obligation and expectation for women to not have sex outside of marriage and to go into a first marriage as a virgin. Um, you know, second marriages, of course, are something different. And that's also something we're going to mention. Um, but so the stakes are honestly pretty high. Um, you know, this is an this is an economic contract between families that depends upon virginity to determine some major parts of it, and also just you know socially, you you want to be well regarded. You want to be regarded as a person and as a part of a family that is in good standing, that is following the rules that they are supposed to follow. Uh, so you know, a lot of the same things that we're familiar with in kind of re more recent American and European history. Um, that are sim that similarly surround questions of virginity. Um, but then the final point uh, having to do with this um, is that if, so there's all this importance extended to virginity, but the problem is verification. And the, the fundamental issue at stake here is that you know, fathers and husbands, um, you know, more people than that, but most essentially fathers and husbands want to be assured that their daughter and their bride are a virgin if she says that she is. But the problem is that no one takes her word for it. You know, you can't, she can't just tell you, yes, I am still a virgin and that's good enough. Of course not. <laughs> it's never that simple. Um, so we end up in this sort of interesting situation that we're going to really explore in which you require verification, or at least you really, really want verification, but it's not easy to get. <laughs> you can't just ask the woman um, what, whether she is or isn't, and then trust her answer. So that's going to set up some sort of interesting conflicts along the way. Um, but so with that kind of as a setup, I did also want to talk about you know, what, what actually 
is virginity? You know, what is the definition of it? And we're actually going to start with modern definitions because it's, it gets very confusing. And part of the reason it gets so confusing is that our modern ideas about what it means to be a virgin are so kind of ingrained that we view them as common sense. You know, we view them as this is just what a virgin is. And that's actually not really the case. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that's so interesting about these texts is we can re we're really going to see a lot of the places where those assumptions are quite a bit different. Um, and so one and one of those pieces that we're going to keep returning to is the question of what about the hymen? You know, is there a hymen? Does it tell you if the woman's a virgin or not? Um, how can you track it? You know, and so that's something that is so kind of deeply intertwined with our modern understanding of what it means to be a virgin that we're going to keep coming back to it um, because it's a point that really can be very confusing because it, and this is what I actually want to talk about right now, is it's very confusing now what we think of it and how it works. Um, so I would actually love it if you guys want to take a minute to either write in the chat or if you want to raise your hand or ask to be unmuted and speak um, uh, in, you know, aloud over Zoom, that would be great. But just what are, what comes to mind when you think of defining virginity? You know, what are the necessary characteristics? All right, we have, we have a hand, A-A-A-N-Y. Got it. Okay. And are you able? Yeah. Hi, yes. I. Uh, there we go. Okay. Hi. Is your name Triple A? Well, I'm, I'm actually I'm using the Zoom of the Astronomical Association of New York, which oh, is why okay. it's on the AAA. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, I also uh, just uh, to give you context, I just finished writing a letter to Aaron Twersky, the dean, one of the deans of the Brooklyn Law School, an erudite scholar who maintains that yeshivas in Brooklyn suppress, do not suppress uh, secular education because the study of Talmud is equivalent to education to the secular education of modern life. So I wrote him to quote the definition of virginity in, in uh, Yevamot, which we just learned on DAF uh, 60A. The definition of a virgin, according to Rav Kahana, is that you sit a young woman on a keg of wine, open keg of wine, and you place her vagina over it. And then if you can smell the scent of the wine in her mouth, that must imply that there's no hymen. Therefore, she most probably is not a virgin. That was in the text of the, I pointed out to our Rep. Tversky that uh, is this the equivalent education that we want young Orthodox men to study uh, as, as indicating that they're ready for the modern world? Yes, and that is that is a very interesting question. Uh, we <laughs> we're not going to get into that today, but I do think that that is a good point. Um, so okay, so and I'm seeing some interesting points in the chat as well. So some people are saying women who have never had penetrative in intercourse, uh, women who are young, which that's actually a really interesting and important point. Um, someone who's never been penetrated by a man who's ejaculated inside of her, which that's an interesting one. Uh, I've never actually heard someone say that specific um, stipulation, which I think is really interesting. Um, let's see, is there anyone else who wants to add anything again over the chat or aloud um, about what you think is kind of the most defining characteristic? of virginity, you know, just in your modern life, having grown up, you know, what people say about it. Let's see. Yes. So even in modern life where we think that there's a very obvious definition of virginity, or at least in my mind, right? Like it, you, it has to be a, a penis in the vagina, right? But essentially we see already in the chat, people have different ideas in their minds about, well, did he ejaculate? Did he not? Already it's not, it's a little bit not clear. Yep. And I'm seeing some people saying never having had intercourse with a male nine years in one day. So you've, you've read some of the rabbinic texts on this. I see uh, no sexual contact beyond heavy petting. 
Um, does anal sex count? This is an excellent question. This is one of the things that comes up, you know, and again, now we're just speaking strictly contemporaneously. We're going to get back to the Talmud in a second, but I think that is a question that is really, really important because it speaks to, well, what do we really mean? You know, do, is it sex? Is it loss of a hymen? Like what, what actually is it? And people can't, decide, right, if anal sex counts, which is why we always get these kind of rumors that go around and around about like, oh, you know, these people, you know, students at Brigham Young where, you know, they're in college, but they're also like very Mormon and expected to keep the highest religious standards. Like, are they all having anal sex? You know, and it's kind of like, it's something that is seen as sort of like a loophole, you know, like, oh, maybe I can do this without and still be considered a virgin. Um, and that is really difficult to answer. You know, it sort of gets to the heart of what is it that we mean by virginity? Um, and so I'm seeing, yeah, not having sex that could lead to pregnancy. So again, that kind of speaks to um, the question of penetrative sex. Um, let's see, yeah, they don't talk about oral sex. That is true. I, I don't know of a place where they really talk about that explicitly. There's a lot of euphemism. Um, which is a whole other question because it's very difficult sometimes to figure out what they're talking about specifically. Um, so, and then someone says, um, no contact with the sexual organ, um, like no hand jobs, no anal, also no sexual relations with, with someone of the same sex. And that is another really important point. Again, they don't really talk about this that much in the Talmud, but it is another really important point. You know, what if you're a woman who has had sex with another woman? Do you still count as a virgin? And, you know, by a lot of classic definitions, you, you would because you haven't had, well, I mean, you might've had penetrative sex, but let's just say that you didn't, um, you know, then, but you still had sex with someone. And so, you know, you, there's all these kind of like, gray areas around this. Um, so, okay. Right, we so have one hand. Would you like to take the question now or hold it for a little later? Uh, let's go ahead and take that question. Okay. Steve, come ask your question. Stephen Cohen. Okay. Well, this is my first lecture on virginity and I'll never forget my first time. <laughs> um, but uh, who does? <laughs> As opposed to the biblical era, where I think it was a physical thing, I think one could, this is a little bit off the wall, but I could, I could, coming as a male, I would say that virginity in the modern world is a state of mind rather than a body. It's, it's, it's a perception of how you see yourself, whether you see yourself as sexually active or as not sexually active. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. And I think that that's a really important part of this that we're going, and we're going to kind of come back to parts of that because, you know, and a lot of people would probably say, well, it's your mindset and also it's what you've done physically, sexually, but, you know, and we're going to talk about sort of the anatomical, uh, you know, sort of parts necessary for understanding virginity. Um, but I do think that actually what you pointed out, Steve, is more important than a lot of people often realize and mention because exactly, if you are a woman who's had non-penetrative sex with another woman, you probably do not think of yourself as a virgin. And I mean, I would say that that is accurate. I would say, you know, why should you think of yourself as a virgin? Um, but one of the things that I think that's getting at is that it's really the social definition that is the most important part. It's not, the anatomy is kind of beside the point. And we're going to get into some of why that is. Um, I did just want to quickly, someone asked about, uh, the definition of the word betulim. Um, so let me just address this quickly because this is, I do think this is interesting. So the Hebrew word for a virgin is betula. So that is, that's a feminine noun. And so a betula is a woman who is a virgin. It also means it's a lot like the English word maiden. 
It means someone who is sexually inexperienced and also someone who is a young woman. Um, so it really, uh, yeah, it really sort of overlaps those two, which gets at what someone else said about youth. Um, and so betulim is the plural of that, but it's not, so it's not the plural of virgins, like virgin girls. What it actually refers to is what's usually called uh, signs of virginity. And that's another really interesting question that we're going to get into. And often that means blood, not always, but that is sort of the first go-to meaning of betulim. Signs of virginity is blood. So I think the easiest way to think of that is signs of virginity. Um, and then someone also, someone else also mentioned um, betulat damim, which is basically like a blood virgin, um, which is someone who has never menstruated. And that is absolutely correct. They mention that in Tosefta and maybe a couple other places. You know, there's a really interesting Tosefta text that says, who's a virgin? It's a woman who's never seen a drop of blood in her life. And even if she's married and had children, if she's never seen blood, then I still call her a virgin. So yes, there are different kinds of virginities. Um, and there's also um, a virginity that has been mentioned of, you know, what is called um, like parturitional virginity, a woman who's never given birth. Um, and that's a whole other subject that we're probably not gonna be able to get into, but it's really interesting. Um, so, okay, so definitely keep asking questions, but I want to kind of direct our attention for a second to just literally the question of what role does the hymen play in this? Because this is a place where it's really easy to get confused because it's confusing. And so, okay, so I would say the sort of biggest points are in our kind of social definition of virginity. And, you know, even if this wasn't your exact experience, you know, this is sort of like, these are sort of broad brush strokes. Um, a hymen is something that covers the vaginal opening. It's something that girls are born with and they have until they have sex. And once they have penetrated sex for the first time, it is irrevocably kind of broken and changed. And is she now has been sort of physically opened and her hymen is broken. And that's where the blood that made a company first, first time penetrative sex comes from. So that's kind of, you know, our sort of cultural story, but the anatomical story is actually very different. Um, and sort of the, the sort of quote real version, you know, the, the sort of medical version of how the hymen works is it's a ring of tissue around the edge of the vagina. That is basically just sort of a holdover from when the internal organs grow to meet the external skin and, you know, the, you know, openings in your body, like eyes, mouth, nose, vagina, all of them, you know, have to kind of like the inside and the outside have to join and form an opening. And it's literally just kind of a leftover of that stage of fetal development before that they were, before they were joined into one continuous opening. And it can look, it can have a whole bunch of different shapes. It's, generally does not cover the entire vaginal opening. If it did, women would not be able to menstruate before the first time they had sex. And that's obviously not the case. There is a medical condition called um, hymen imperfera, I think, um, which, is a which is a case where the hymen fully covers the vaginal opening, but it, it is a medical condition. It can be dangerous. You know, girls can't menstruate. Um, blood kind of builds up inside their vagina and uterus. Like it's, it's not great. And it's not, you know, that's, it's, it's pathological. It's not typical, like normal human functioning. Um, and so, and the other thing with the hymen as a ridge of tissue is it's not necessarily changed by having penetrative sex. It doesn't really have to be impacted at all. And even if it is, it could be impact. It could be, you know, it can tear and bleed that is a thing that's possible, but that could happen anytime when you have sex. It doesn't have to be the first time. Uh, you know, it's not super common, um, but it is possible. And it also isn't, you know, it isn't irrevocably changed if it is torn, it just grows back. It's like any other tissue. Um, like I think I was telling Rachel in a previous conversation that I am pretty sure I remember reading a scientific article about this uh, which mentioned a woman who had actually given birth 
and her hymen, which partially covered her vaginal opening, had just grown back. So you can actually, you know, it regenerates like any other tissue in the body. So it doesn't generally tell you anything about a woman's sexual history. So I just want that to be kind of clear in our minds because it is so easy to get confused. So, you know, the sort of scientific medical version of virginity is kind of that there isn't a version of virginity. Like virginity is a social construct. It doesn't, there's no change in your body, you know, as a woman, the first time that you have sex. And this, you know, this goes back to what Stephen, what Steve was saying, like, you know, it kind of makes sense. Like we can't even decide what counts. Um, so, you know, if there were something really objective there, it would probably be a little bit easier, but there's not, it's, it's really more of a sort of social issue than it is a physical one. So, okay. So with that kind of, um, okay, let's see. I'm, uh, yes. Imperfect hymen. Thank you. Um, I think we can go ahead to the text. I think we're ready. Thank you so much for all that background. I'm going to put them in the chat one more time. I'm sorry. The first link was a copy paste error on my part, but here's the correct link for the text today. Um, Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And so we're going to, so, all right. So we're going to look at the very first text here, which as you can see is Mishnah Ketubo one, two to three. Um, And so this is going to sort of let us think about, okay, what actually is a virgin to the rabbis? What do they, what do they think it is? What does it consist of? What breaks it? All of those things. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. Uh, and then we're going to talk about it. So Mishnah Ketubah 1-2 says the ketuba, and this is the ketuba payment again of a virgin is 200 dinars, which is a denom- denomination of money of a widow. It's one money, which is a hundred. So basically the ketubah payment that a widow gets is half the amount that a virgin gets. And this is a floor, you know, you could negotiate more, but this is a baseline. A virgin who became a widow or a divorcee from betrothal, so before full marriage, um, their ketubah is 200 dinars. So what that means is if you have a virgin girl, she gets betrothed to a man, and then he either dies or they end the betrothal before they were fully married, she still counts as a virgin. So that makes sense, right? They probably have not had sex. That's the expectation. Um, And one may file a virginity suit against them. So we're going to get back to virginity suits in a second. So I'm going to just put that to the side for now. But a female convert, captive, or slave who is emancipated, converted, or set free below the age of three years in one day, their ketubah is 200 dinars, and one may file a virginity suit against them. So... This one is a little bit more complicated. So basically a convert, a captive and a slave all have something in common. And that is basically they were not kind of in a Jewish household uh, and sort of under the control and you know influence of Jewish laws and Jewish families. So a convert, right, could have just grown up um, as in some other religion. A captive and a slave, of course, have the added problem that they didn't really have any control over their lives or their sexual experiences. So the assumption is if someone is a convert, they're a captive or a slave, they probably have had sex. Whether or not that is actually physically true is irrelevant to the law. So they're just saying we presume that, all you know, because it's safer than presuming that you are a virgin when you're not. We're going to presume that if you're a captive, a convert, or a slave, you had sex. But the part of this that's also important is they have this age cutoff. So if a girl had sex before she was the age of three years and one day, she still counts as a virgin. So why this is is another question. We might be able to get into some of this, but the age, so the age cutoff is three years and one day. So if a girl over the age of three years and one day had sex, she doesn't count as a virgin anymore, but if she was under that, she still counts. Um, okay, and so then Mishnah Ketuba 1-3, if a man who was of age penetrated a girl who was a minor, so in this case, minor means under the age of three years in a day, or a boy who was a minor, the age for boys is a little different. So the age for boys of sort of sexual minority is under the age of nine years in a day. 
So a boy who was a minor under the age of nine penetrated a girl who was of age over the age of three, or what's called a mokat etz. A mokat etz is a girl who's been penetrated by something that's not a penis. So that mokat etz literally means struck or injured by wood. It's a little bit hard to know precisely what they mean by that. Um, you know, what the exact mechanism is, but basically it's a girl who has been penetrated, but not by having sex. Um, so all of those people, their ketubah is 200 dinars, which is the ketubah of a virgin. So this is really interesting. Um, and we're going to get back to that in a second, but so, okay. And then these are the words of Rabbi Mayer. So Rabbi Mayer is the one who says all three of those categories count as a virgin, but the sages, so the rest of the rabbis, they disagree when it comes to the ketubah of a mokat atz, the girl who's been penetrated by something that's not a penis. They say she only gets a ketubah of one mane. So that means she gets the same ketubah that a widow would get. Um, okay. So let us kind of step back for a second. Um, because there's a lot of different things going on here and a lot of questions that this kind of raises. Um, so, okay. So one question would be looking at the first Mishnah. So Mishnah Ketubo 1-2. Um, what, what would we actually say counts as a virgin in this case? Um, does, does anyone want to actually take a stab at answering that? If people are, if it's, if it's too fast, I'll go ahead and give you an answer. But if anyone has some thoughts about in that first Mishnah in particular, what are kind of the important characteristics of someone who's considered a virgin? Um, yes. You can raise your hands or put it in the chat. I will yep. watch for hands raised. Yep. So someone said she's Jewish. So that is a really important part of it. Um, does anyone else have thoughts they want to add? Um, Debbie, oh, yeah. Debbie Cohen is raising her hand. Debbie, we got you. Yep. You got me. Do you have me? Yep. Yes. We hear you. <laughs> so, of, in this particular Mishnah, a, the, 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 the virginity is linked to the fact that the woman has a relationship with the man that is socially recognized, either through marriage or through her position as a slave or a captive, so that she has a relationship that is, is recognized socially and there's an expectation of how that relationship was carried out. In the case of the, the, vir the, the one, the virgin of the, who becomes a widow, uh, because it's an expectation that as a, as a betrothed woman, she still has not had sex near, just like someone who wasn't betrothed yet. And then there's the expectation of the others that they're in a position that probably somebody has taken advantage of them and their lowly position. And so there's a there's a relationship issue there that that casts the the uh, image over them of whether or not they have virginity. Yes. No, that was a that was a great answer. Uh, you hit on the most important points, which is this is clearly a, at least at the moment. It is a purely social definition of virginity. You are a Jewish woman who has been in kind of a Jewish family, you know, standard family life from sometime before you were the age of three years old in one day. Um, and you have not had a socially recognized sexual relationship. So yeah, exactly. Betrothal, you're not assumed to have had sex, so it doesn't count. Full marriage, you're assumed to have had sex, so it does count. So yes, you're a Jewish woman or a woman who has come under into sort of Jewish control before the age of three, and you have not actually had a socially recognized sexual relationship. Um, okay, so yeah, and someone asks, you know, are we going to assume it was 
actually yet people are actually having sex with girls below the age of menstruation. Why do they use the age of three? This one is difficult. So first off, we don't, and I, I'm going to try to address this kind of briefly because we only have so much time, but first off, we don't have any actual evidence at all, uh, you know, direct evidence telling us whether this ever happened. It's unlikely we can't say anything for 100% certainty, but this is a legal question for the rabbis. And for whatever reason, the cutoff age is three. So the, you know, and again, this one's difficult because there's only so many assumptions that we can and can't make, but most likely this is literally the legal cutoff age, not one that is regularly being, you know, sort of, being used in practical everyday life. And we have other texts in the Talmud that talk about, you know, you should not have sex with children. Um, so this is really a sort of legal boundary category, not actually something that is typically happening in everyday life where, you know, a man might potentially become betrothed to a, a girl who's under three. That's not that uncommon for people to be betrothed at birth or your early childhood, but actual sexual encounters uh, between very young girls, unlikely. But this is a difficulty. You know, this is something that makes these texts hard. Um, Although they have no problem assuming other cultures are doing it, right? Oh, they sure. say that it's wrong and we don't do this, though they acknowledge that it could happen. But they, they do in this mission say, you know, we assume that if she didn't grow up in a Jewish household, this is just par for the course for her. Absolutely. Which, uh, you, you know, know. <laughs> absolutely. Wow. <laughs> There's really interesting texts about, you know, all of the things in uh, Avodah Zarah, all of the things that weird sexual things that Jews assume Gentiles do. And you know, this is a whole other uh, topic, which is also fascinating. Um, but OK, so first Mishnah kind of covers the social definition. Second Mishnah is we're going to get more into a physical definition, but that physical definition is actually really confusing. Um, and so, okay, so let me go over that with a little bit more detail. So a man who was of age penetrated a girl who was a minor. So these are people who are, um, so these are people who are still considered virgins. So there's a girl underneath the age of three who had sex with a boy who's over the age of nine. So we've, we've already, and if also if she had sex with a boy under the age of nine, she's under three, it doesn't matter. No matter what happened to her, she's still considered a virgin, as long as it happened before the age of three. Or if a boy who was under nine penetrated a girl who was over the age of three, she's still considered a virgin. That's really interesting. So she was over the age of three. She had sex with someone, but because he was under the age of nine, she's still a virgin. And there's no disagreement on that in this, in this Mishnah. No, no rabbis disagree with that one. The next one is a mokat etz, a girl who was penetrated by something not a penis. Robbie Mayer says that she is still a virgin. But the rest of the sages say, no, 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 that one is not a virgin. So this one's really weird because we might expect if, so if we're going to say that a girl over the age of three who had sex with a boy under the age of nine and a girl who was penetrated by something not a penis, if we were going to say one of those was not a virgin, we'd probably want to go with the girl who actually had sex. You know, that, that would probably be the most sort of knee-jerk reaction. Um, but that's not where they go. She is actually still, you know, a girl who had sex with a boy under the age of nine, she's still a virgin. Girl who was non-sexually penetrated, there's disagreement. They're not sure. Um, and I think that, so there's a few reasons why this might be, um, people have kind of speculated on this. Um, some, some people have speculated that a boy who's under the age of nine, his genitals are not considered mature enough to actually kind of open her as a non-virgin. Um, you know, the hymen is a possibility. Maybe they think that he couldn't break the hymen or something like that. It was more likely to have been broken if she was penetrated by whatever, you know, whatever struck by wood means. Um, and then, but okay. But so first I want to, I know Steven, you have a question. So I want to take that 
Uh, and then I'm going to go into the next point. All right, Stephen. Okay, real quick question. Um, what about penetration by a fertility god, a failing fertility god, um, while she is betrothed in anticipation of marriage and the onus on a, a young woman to produce an offspring? So this is, this is an, you're thinking Talmudically here. So I'm pretty sure the answer would be they don't believe in fertility gods. Um, so, how about Rachel and Leah? Um, wasn't one of them hiding household gods under her bed when they came to inspect? Uh, yeah, see, you're, you're drawing a nice straight line between the Torah and the Talmud here. And it doesn't always work. <laughs> the rabbis try to do that. <laughs> they Oh, they certainly do. But there are times when they just conveniently skip over okay. some certain things in the Torah that don't quite line up. So I think the, the easiest possibly cop-out answer is they don't believe in fertility gods. So they're not going to go there. Uh, you know, and the fact that people in the Torah baby did, eh, we're going to, we're going to sweep that under the rug. That's not a rabbinic thing. Um, so, okay, so here I just, so I wanna mention that um, another, a potentially easier way of thinking about this, and I actually, based on my work, think probably more accurate, most likely they did not, at this point when the Mishnah was composed and redacted, they did not have a concept of a hymen. And this is based on comparative research with um, Greek gynecological literature, where there's been debate about this, it's not 100% clear, but the, it is, the consensus is, and it's most likely that they did not understand that there was a hymen, they didn't have a concept of it, they didn't believe it covered the, the vaginal um, entrance, they didn't think that it was key to virginity. More likely, they were using something similar to, to the Greek model, which is visualized as kind of an upside down drawstring pouch. So the pouch part is the uterus and the vagina. And then the drawstring pouch is the entrance to the vagina. And so it's not covered. It's just drawn tightly closed. So this kind of helps a little bit because, I mean, you know, it's a similar argument to with the hymen, but it's sort of like, okay, maybe a boy under nine, he can't actually like open that drawstring pouch. Maybe something else could. But so here that we don't have a whole lot of evidence pointing us toward a hymen drawstring pouch model, but we're going to get into some other things that actually make it a little bit that where the drawstring pouch model makes it a little bit easier. But I do want to introduce that idea is that there's a good likelihood they did not, they were not imagining a hymen here. And so it's going to be confusing the more we rely on that because it's probably a non-hymenal model of virginity. Um, so, okay. And so let me see. Um, so someone has said both the widow and the Mokad Ets were devalued in comparison to the virgin one through legal marriage, uh, and the other, because despite her lack of regular sexual relations, penetration of her body devalues her anyway. So I think that this is an interesting point and the sticking point for me is why, why would non-sexual penetration devalue her when actual sexual penetration doesn't? And I don't necessarily have an answer for this. I, you know, I think that this is something that's really sort of ambiguous and difficult to answer. But that I think is kind of the key to this particular Mishnah is like, okay, even if we assume that, you know, penetration devalues her, why isn't it any penetration? And why is it actually non-sexual penetration that is a bigger deal in changing her status? That I think is kind of, you know, one of the important things to keep in mind here is that there's sort of a flag. Something is probably going on here that doesn't quite line up with what we expect to see from virginity based on sort of our unconscious assumptions. Um, so I actually, okay, so I want to go on to the next text. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover quite all of it, but so, okay. So this first one kind of set the stage for what actually is a virgin and socially we know it, you know, it's someone who is Jewish, 
who has not been married, who's not had a socially recognized sexual relationship, physically a little bit less clear, someone who hasn't been penetrated in kind of the quote normal way, but there's some vagueness there. There's some gray areas. They're not hundred percent clear on it either. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, and so we're going to, so we're going to take a look at um, Bavli Katu Boat, uh, 10A to 10B. And this is a cycle of stories where men bring their new brides who they just married the night before, you know, the day before, uh, you know, they had sex for the first time on their wedding day and they bring their bride to a rabbi the next morning. And they say, rabbi, she signed her wedding contract as a virgin. She told me she was a virgin, but I don't think she is. I think she was lying. So, okay. So it says there was a man who came before Rabbi Nachman and he said, I found an open opening. This is really interesting. We're going to get into it. Rabbi Nachman said, give him lashes with palm branches. He's been sleeping around with prostitutes. So this is kind of a humorous, like, okay, well, how would you know, man? You're not supposed to, you're not really supposed to have had sex before marriage either. So if you're going to know when you had sex with your bride, but you must've been sleeping around. Um, so that one's kind of a humorous one. So, and the second one is a man came before Robin Gamaliel ben Rabi. He said to him, I found an open opening. Robin Gamaliel ben Rabi said to him, perhaps you angled your penetration. I'll make an analogy to what is this matter similar to a man who was walking in darkness at night. And if he angles, he would find it open. And if he did not angle, he would find it locked. Some say, Robin Gamaliel said to him, perhaps you forcefully or deliberately angled and you uprooted the door in the bowl. Uh, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, there was a man who came before Robin Gamaliel ben Rabi. He said to him, I penetrated my wife and I did not find blood. She said to him, Rabbi, I, Rabbi, I was a virgin. He said to them, bring me that cloth. So this is probably the cloth that's like the bed sheet or something, you know, whatever they were having, they were supposedly having sex on. They brought him the cloth. He soaked it in water and he washed it and he found on it a few drops of blood. He said to him, go enjoy your purchase. So your purchase, meaning your bride. He has, he has purchased his bride. Um, so this is interesting. He somehow found buried drops of blood in this bed sheet or whatever it is. So uh, a man came before Robin Gamaliel by Rabbi. He said to him, Rabbi, I had sex with my bride and I did not find blood. She said to him, Rabbi, I'm still a virgin. So, and then here's where we're going to get a repeat of Yabba about 60. He said to them, bring me two maidservants, one virgin and one who's not a virgin who has been penetrated. They brought them to him. He placed them on the barrel of wine. In the case of the woman who had been penetrated, the smell from the wine entered her vagina, went through her body, came out her mouth. But in the case of the virgin, the smell did not go through. They couldn't smell it on her breath. So having verified that this test works, he places the accused wife on the barrel. The smell doesn't go through. And he says, go enjoy your purchase. Meaning, you know, your purchase is your bride you're going to stay married to this woman. You know, your virginity suit is denied. Um, you know, she, I, I'm telling you she was a virgin, so go forth and live your life. Um, so, okay. So there, there's a lot of sort of confusing things going on in this text. And I would say that sort of the two main questions are, what are these standards that the grooms are talking about? These standards of non-virginity? And why are the rabbis turning all of them away? Um, and I'm not going to say that there's a definitive answer to these, but uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have some ideas. Um, so basically, so, okay. So these men are bringing what's called a virginity suit, which is not, not surprisingly means, you know, the woman or more, more specifically her father signed the marriage contract saying she was a virgin. Um, and, now he has concluded that she's not. And so he's going to sue her basically for breach of contract. That's more or less what it is. Um, and so they're making these claims based on two different standards. We saw that in the text. Um, and so even though it came second in the text, we're gonna talk about blood first, cause it's simpler. Um, and so the standard of blood comes from the Torah. It comes from Deuteronomy. Um, which is a pretty famous text where, um, you know, if the man accuses the woman of not having been, virg been a virgin, um, this is Deuteronomy 22, 15. 
says the father of the young woman and the mother shall then submit the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city. Um, and this is, I can't remember exactly where it specifies it, but um, this is basically the, you know, this is the famous bloodied bed sheet. You know, they bring the sheet that has the blood of virginity on it. And they say, see, he is lying. My daughter was a virgin. So this is sort of the basis for the idea of the blood standard, that if she bleeds, it proves she's a virgin. If she doesn't bleed, then it call, calls into question whether she actually was. Um, but, and then, okay, so that's the blood standard, just what it sounds like you expect her to bleed if she's actually a virgin. The second standard is, it's the one that they're referring to when they say open opening. Um, and it basically means just vaginal narrowness or tightness. So it means he had sex with her and he was like, she didn't feel tight enough. This is, this is what the, you know, this is what the open opening claim means. So there's kind of some problems with both of these, which I think is going to lead us to this question of, so why do the rabbis keep sort of what seems like searching for excuses to send these grooms away, right? Like, you know, we've got like, you know, this weird thing with like washing the blood sheet, the bed sheet, and somehow like magically finding blood on it that wasn't there. It's like, it kind of seems like they're stretching. Um, so there's kind of like, there's a couple of different points to make here. So one is both of these standards have some kind of issues with them. And we just know that this is true. Not all virgins bleed. You know, even if they are truly virgins, they don't necessarily bleed. And the rabbis seem to be kind of aware of this. And they actually, there are specific texts um, where they talk about a woman who's called a bogaret, which means a grown woman. So someone who is past the age of puberty and hasn't been married yet. And they actually specifically say she's not expected to bleed. She's old enough. But they don't think that she necessarily will. So that's for her, that's not considered proof. So they're already aware like this isn't always reliable. And that's also where they kind of um, get into this question of angling that we're going to get back to in a second. Um, but the final point that I wanted to make about the blood standard is that this is another one where people assume that they have to be talking about the hymen because what else would be causing blood? But this one, you actually don't have to assume that they were using a model, a, a model of virginity that had a hymen in order to understand it. So again, we're going to talk about the Greek version because we have so much more, so many more detailed texts on this from the Greek perspective. But in Greek gynecological literature, they actually say, and this is, this is a quote, um, the blood comes from vessels, blood vessels, which take their origin from the uterus. And when the furrows are spread apart in defloration, those vessels burst and cause pain and the blood that is excreted usually follows. So basically this is just a source of blood that's not a hymen. They basically imagine that like there are these kind of big blood vessels around, you know, around the vagina. And when she has sex for the first time, they're kind of spread and split and broken. And that's where the blood comes from. And then afterward, they're not being spread as much. So there's no more blood. So again, you know, I want to kind of reiterate that like a lot of these things where we think surely they must mean a hymen, what else could be producing blood? There are actually more explanations for those things. So, okay. So the narrowness standard is the other one. And so this is, again, this one is actually maybe easier to understand with that kind of upside down drawstring pouch model um, because you know, okay, if she's had sex before, then like the drawstring has been a little bit loosened and we're not worried about the hymen because they probably didn't think it was there. Um, so, but, so, you know, the idea of a narrowness standard is very straightforward, but the social implications are kind of problematic because this relies solely on the groom's word. You know, blood at least has an, some kind of objective proof. You know, you can bring the blood sheet or the, the bed sheet that has blood on it and that they, you know, and say, point to a blood stain and say, look, she bled, she must be a virgin. Whether or not that's true is a separate issue. Um, but narrowness, there's no proof. You know, it's just the groom says, mm, I thought so. 
you know, and Rabbi Nachman points to this when he says, like, what have you been sleeping with prostitutes, like left, right and center? Like, how would you know? Um, and so this kind of speaks to, you know, this would be a real social problem. And someone in the uh, comments just said this, are the grooms being cheap and they just want their money back? That's a real possibility. That might be a lot of why they're doing it. Um, and so that's a problem. Like they don't really want to kind of let that go unchecked. Um, and then there's, but there's also the complication of this thing called angling, which this is a whole topic that we could go into, but the brief version is basically the later sort of Babylonian, you know, rabbis who were writing and editing had this idea that like, well, if you're kind of like good at sex, then you can do this thing where you kind of angle and you don't really cause her to bleed. But then the problem with that, right, is that it kind of invalidates the blood standard. If you can penetrate a virgin woman with that and you have the skill to not make her bleed, then how could you ever tell anyone was a virgin? You know, if she, if she can have sex for the first time and not bleed, then, you know, maybe she could have sex for a second time with someone who doesn't know this technique and bleed and look like a virgin. So there's really kind of like, if you really kind of drill down on these problems, some of them really kind of disrupt the foundational understanding of just like, how do you prove who a virgin is and how can you be certain ever? Um, oh, someone says, wasn't there a sage who was an expert in this? Yes, there was. So it's um, Bavli Nida 64B. Uh, Shmuel says, I am able to perform many penetrations without blood. Um, so he's bragging, you know, I'm really good at this. So, but he's breaking this whole system. So, you know, I think, so that I think is sort of one of the possible explanations for why the rabbis are so interested in turning the screams away is, you know, you'd really be having all of these kind of like recently divorced, or maybe it would be the equivalent of an annulment, these women who have been sort of rejected by their husbands, who now really kind of have no social supports. And that's not great. But I also think that honestly, um, you know, I, I think that there's kind of a more existential part of this, um, which is, you know, if part of being Jewish for a woman is following proper, you know, uh, purity laws around her period, you know, living her life in kind of, you know, presumably living her life to sort of fulfill those social expectations of no sex until marriage. So you kind of, I think, have this anxiety that if you really can't tell if women are virgins, maybe like, is she a good Jewish woman? Are your children going to be the right part, like the right Jewish, the right way? Like, are they, are women kind of upholding their end of the bargain? And because, you know, rabbinic lawmakers are men, and they don't really give women kind of equal partnership in terms of collaborating on creating laws and observing practices. It's kind of, it kind of puts them in a bind. You know, you get the, you get women who are necessary, you know, you have to get married, you have to have children, you need your, you need your wife to be Jewish in order for your children to be Jewish. But if you also can't trust her when she says that she's a virgin and that she has lived her life Jewishly in the way that she's supposed to, um, then that's a problem. Like, you know, how are you supposed to be sure that your family is Jewish and, you know, you're following the laws the way you're supposed to. So I think that, so for me, that's kind of the underlying problem. There's kind of the obvious social problem, but then there's also kind of like a, a bottom layer of, you know, more an, of an existential identity problem of, you know, not just how do we verify this woman is a virgin, but kind of how do we verify that she is who she says she is? She's Jewish. She's, you know, she's proper. She's done all the things that she's supposed to do when I can't see her. Um, so there is much more that we could get into. Um, but <laughs> someone says it's clear that one class is not enough. I don't disagree. All right, but you can all petition Rachel if you want to, if you want me to come back and do another one. Um, but so if people need to leave, then no problem. This is a one hour class. Um, but if people would like to ask some questions right now, I have time. I'm happy to stay for a few extra minutes. Um, 
but yeah, so I'd love to hear sort of what people are thinking and, you know, what this brings up for them or new questions that this prompted. Yeah, Dr. Campbell, there's a, there's a lot that's very confusing here because I feel like I feel like a lot of what you showed us in just two very simple texts is it's not clear what the definition of virginity is. It's not clear how you can confirm whether somebody is a virgin. It's not clear medically what they thought was going on. Like there's a whole, and, and it's also, there are all these social things that are not clear. Like, what do we make of these men who get married and sign a ketubah and promise her a, a virgin payment to the what marriage end? And then after one night with her, they're suddenly coming, running to their rabbi and saying, nah, I don't think so, right? You know, what, exactly. is, and the what are they doing? Do they not like their bride? Are they just being cheap? And, you know, exactly. it, and there's, there's a, a lot social, that's complicated here. There's a social and religious power imbalance, right? You know, there's the men have the sort of, they have the power to file this virginity suit. And the women don't have the power to say, I was a virgin and just be believed. You know, you see that the rabbis, even, in, you know, when the rabbis are sort of clearly kind of on the woman's side, um, so to speak, they have to find some kind of evidence. They can't just be like, well, she said she was a virgin. You know, they have to find something to back it to back it up. So you get these weird things where they wash the sheet, they put her naked on the barrel of wine, you know, like they have to fall back on something. So they've kind of set themselves, you know, it's not just them, you know, this is the whole world. <laughs> it's not, you know, every, everyone's doing it, but, you know, they've kind of ended up in this situation where they've kind of painted themselves into a corner. You know, the women are, you, you kind of need to believe the women in order for things to you know, proceed smoothly in your society. But you also aren't really willing to say like, no, we're just going to believe them and just say, okay, whatever, you know, whatever you say, we're going to go with. How much of this would have been simpler if we just said, we believe what she says. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you end up with all of these kind of like, ambiguous ideas of like, maybe this is what it is. And maybe you can figure it out this way, but maybe not. Um, you know, and it, it continues to be throughout, you know, all the texts on this very confusing and very, they, I think they themselves are extremely conflicted. And that is part of the way, part of the reason why it's so confusing is they can't necessarily decide for themselves and certainly between each other. Um, technical question in the chat. Folks want to know where they can read your dissertation. Is there a copy of that available to the public? Yes. So it is not fully available to the public. So it is available through um, ProQuest dissertations and theses. So, and that is available to anyone who has access to, a, to an academic library. Um, so Rachel, you and I can work out if we want to like try to like post a PDF somewhere so that if people don't have access to an academic library, we can figure that out. But if you do have a login through any academic library, then you can find that database quote, ProQuest dissertations and theses. And if you search my name, then you'll be able to read the full text. Okay. Um, I think we also usually send a follow-up email for this quest. So uh, for this class, so we may be able to attach a copy of it to that as well. Um, okay. And then I also saw in the chat a question where people can view the program again. We will post this in fairly short order to YouTube, to the My Jewish Learning YouTube channel. So you can watch it on repeat until it all makes sense. If it ever does, which is an open question. <laughs> Okay, I think I think it's probably a good idea for us to call it here since it's it has been an hour and um, people have different um, uh, schedules and things. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kamholtz, for coming. And I think, by the way, I meant to mention this at the top, but I think I didn't. But Dr. Kamholtz and I go back a long way. We went to graduate school together. So uh, in addition to being a, a colleague, she's also a friend. And I'm so glad you were able to come here and share some really interesting texts and some insights from um, a, a long period of uh, research that you did. Yeah, this um, is great. I mean, there's not... There is only so many people in the world who are dying to know about virginity in the Talmud. So it is a joy to get to explain it. And I obviously think it is so interesting and so complicated and has so many layers that I think it's really fun to kind of try to dive into and figure out you know, what's really going on here. Well, at least 150 other people of this class is, uh, has anything to say about it. So yes, that, that's right. Well, you can all go forth now and feel like you are experts 
Uh, well, I don't know, maybe not. I don't even always feel like I'm an expert, but uh, <laughs> you can at least hopefully have a better grasp of kind of what the many questions are at issue here, if not the answers, which of course rabbis are much better at asking questions uh, than providing you with clear, concrete answers. So it's very appropriate. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today for asking such good questions. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cam Holtz for the presentation. And we will see you all, if you're a Dafyomi reader, we'll see you tomorrow. Otherwise, hopefully in another class sometime too. Yep. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.